Hello class, um, here we are again online. Um, last time I lectured to you guys about World War II and that leads us directly into the Cold War. The Cold War pretty much starts the minute. Now, so let's look at World War II. As World War II is coming to an end, you have um, the, the big three meeting at Yalta, FDR, Churchill, Stalin. There you see them seated together. Um, there, as the war is coming to an end, they're looking beyond the war. They're looking, what is the world going to look like afterwards? And they make certain agreements at the Yalta Conference. And that is to say that, you know, they look at what is going to happen to Europe. You know, Europe is in shambles. You know, you have all these clinchers in the Eastern Bloc that were mowed over by the German army, then mowed over by the Russian army as they're going toward Germany. So um, they, they come to a couple of agreements. One, they decide to create the United Nations finally. This is something Wilson put forth in his 14 points as far as League of Nations. They start to see the real need for a UN. Somewhere where people can talk it out before they shoot it out. They also look at um, Germany itself. They don't trust Germany at this point. They don't want Germany just to simply be... Even paying reparations like that happened in World War One, they're like, well, that in their eyes, that you know, that, that that left too much open. So they decided to divide the country of Germany into sections, four sections: one for the Soviet Union, one for the United States, one for England, and one for France. Then they tentatively agreed to have free elections for the countries that have been like pretty much either absorbed by Ger Germany on the way out and then absorbed by Russia on the way in. And we're looking at Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, places like this. Um, and so this is, you know, the gist of the Yalta conference, you know, the, the, the vision these three leaders had for how the world was going to go forward. Unfortunately, there was a lot of stuff going on in the background. At that point, you know, FDR knows about the, you know, is waiting on the f final product of the development of the atomic bomb. And Stalin has spies and he knows about it as well. So, um, after the war, after the dropping of the bomb, after, you know, secession of fighting both in the Pacific and the Atlantic, there's yet another conference. And this one is at Potsdam. And um, it's at that point that you could really see the Cold War ignite, you know, you know, in a way you know, backwards. But like when we look at, you know, Cold War, but then we are, the, the tensions ignite. And this is what happens um, when um, the war is over. And remember, they had made an agreement to start dividing up Germany. They also made an agreement to give, um, you know, these countries free elections to give them, you know, um, their choice as to what's going to happen to them, you know, like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and so forth. Stalin stands up in the Potsdam Conference and states to everybody else that those countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, that you see there on the map, and of course Eastern Germany that he gets a piece of, um, he doesn't feel like he needs to let them go. His point to the allies, to the other allies, is that every time the Soviet Union has been invaded, it has been through those countries. And so he feels that if he, he maintains control of those countries, he can use them as a shield to protect the homeland. He can use them as a buffer zone to protect the homeland. And so he refuses to relinquish power there. Mind you, he is occupying armies there. As he, as he as his army, the Soviet Union, marched into Germany, he left, you know, occupying armies in all these countries. Because why not? You got you can't keep it, you need to keep an eye on your backside. So as at this point he re, he refuses to give up this land. And Winston Churchill describes this as though an iron curtain has come down between Eastern Europe and the rest of Europe. All communication, commerce, cut off. And so this is the big, you know, real beginnings of the Cold War, the line in the sand, so to say. So the United States, we're not dumb. You know, we are not Hitler. We're not Napoleon. We've learned there is no way we're ever going to invade Russia. Russia's huge. There's no way to go invade it, defeat it, and keep an occupying army. We're not that dumb. But we also do not want 
this communism to spread beyond where it is. So we're like, you, communism is fine in Russia. Okay, we're not going to do anything to it. We're going, but we're going to ensure what we want is to keep it there. This just becomes what we know, we recall, um, refer to as a policy of containment. Contain communism where it is. Um, and sh shortly after, as if like, you know, um, to, to sh you know, illustrate the point, there is a communist uprising in Greece and Turkey. And um, Secretary of State at the time, Dean Atkinson, um, very strong anti-communist, um, um, you know, points out to Truman that we need to have a policy to deal with stuff like this. We need to have a policy of containment, but we need to declare it on a declared policy. And this is what becomes known as the Truman Doctrine. Now, um, Truman Doctrine, I'll, you know, I'll put, I'll explain in a second, but it, you know, it has a whole bunch of things tied to it to keep communism contained, stuff like the Marshall Plan and so forth. So, you know, here you have um, Truman Doctrine basically is a he, Truman stating, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressure. And so what it's basically declaring is like I used to, I like to call it our promise to the world that if you have problems with communism, we will be there for you, whether it's sending money, sending arms, you know, training your troops and even sending troops. And this is like the Truman Doctrine is what will lead to conflicts all over the world where the United States sends troops like in Korea and Vietnam. You know, but there's other places, too, in small ways and in big ways that, you know, they're all influenced under the Truman Doctrine. Now, the first major piece of legislation that's connected to this containment policy and part of this Truman Doctrine is the Marshall Plan. In my opinion, one of the best um um, policies the United States has ever put forth in, you know, in the inter international arena. You know, our foreign policy has been, you know, iffy here and there. But the Marshall Plan, the way it was set up and the way it was carried out, that was, you know, one of the best things the United States could do. Now, you know, there, there are all kinds of ulterior motives to happen in the Marshall Plan. But, you know, on, on its face value, it's a good thing. Basically, you know, Secretary of the Army, Marshall looks at Europe and what's left of it. I mean, it's completely devastated. And he says that we must help them rebuild. We must help them, you know, get everything going. And, you know, where are they going to get supplies but from us? Um, if you can see there on, on the PowerPoint, you'll see the seal. It says for European recovery. Every bit of recovery you know whether it's food supplies tools whatever had that stamp on it to tell people in europe that it, especially in germany that it, it, this, it is the united states that's helping you now he does this you know yes he wants to help him rebuild europe you know half those guys are our allies but he does this also because you know europe needs rebuilding and who's going to do it and there's only two people left standing it's us and the soviet union so if we don't do it, guess who will? So this is our way of containing communism where it was, keeping it in Eastern, Eastern Europe, like, never mind, we got this, we're fixing it. And, you know, and in his head also, like I said, there, you know, there's ulterior motives. I mean, what he's doing is one, he's guaranteeing, you know, that our presence in Europe. He's also creating trade partners and allies for life, which they still are. Um... And when we look at the Marshall Plan, we also have to understand that um, the Marshall Plan was put in effect as a policy of containment and also as an economic policy, but also to win over the Germans. Because, I mean, Germany is part of this. And we're trying, you know, and, and, you know, one way of keeping another Hitler in our in the sense of back then and hopefully today is the fact that we will become friends and allies. That will not be the boogeyman or the evil thing or something that, you know, could be exploited by some, you know, some some crazy person in Germany. You know, it, it, that's why the seal on those boxes are for. To tell people it is us, we're here to help. 
And so um, it's a huge, massive economic package it's given. It's about $11 billion over three years, and it's part of the Marshall Plan. Now here you can see, you know, the in-run results of the Marshall Plan. You see, you know, on the left, you know, you know, you, um, a city before the Marshall Plan. You see on the right, a city after the Marshall Plan. Incidentally, when we look at this picture, also picture this, that um, when you look at, you know, the nice built section, understand that, you know, there's a section of Germany that is still belongs to the Soviet Union. And they're not doing no Marshall Plan over there. So, you know, you could basically, you know, those poor people on the other side can see, like, how nice people are living there as opposed to how they're living in the conditions under the Soviet Union. Now, going back to the Truman Doctrine. Um, like I said, it was our pledge to the world. We will be there. You know, we start sending aid to Europe. We start, I mean, to Turkey, to Greece. Um, and so when we're looking at it, you know, this is also our way of, like, you know, telling the Soviet Union, you stay where you are. You know, um, if you, we see you rise up anywhere else but inside your country, we will be there. So in a sense, though, so if you look at Marshall Plan and you look at the Truman Doctrine, in a sense, if you're a Soviet, you would see it almost like a threatening posture by the Americans. You would see it as almost like a bullying posture you know, uh, posture by the Americans. Like we're bullying them. Hey, you stay in your neighborhood. We don't want to see you around here. Now, in a sense, we're not doing that in the sense we are, but you have to also put yourself in the mindset of the times. Like I said, a lot of it was misunderstanding. So, uh, but you can clearly see how the Soviet Union would react to something like this. Like here we are right next to them, you know, gentrifying the neighborhood in a sense, right? Rebuilding, fixing everything up. And, you know, and, and the people on the other side of the border are looking at it going, I want to go over there. So in a sense, we're enticing the people out of their country to come over to our country, which becomes a big problem when you look at, you know, Berlin Wall, which we'll get into in a bit. So anyways, in, in, so anyway, uh, let's move on. So um, now when I, when I describe the breakup of Germany, one thing, I mean, I could never really see the logic of this. Like, I mean, literally... Uh, when I explain this to you, you're gonna, you know, you're also gonna like, why would they do that? So the, they divide Germany into four sections, you know, like I said, Russia, you know, U.S., France, you know, Great Britain, but then they also decide to divide Berlin, the capital city, into four sections, which is um, German, you know, in the, in the same in the same sense, so. You you have to look at Stalin and, and and that's and the capital city of Berlin is in the center of Stalin's piece of Germany, in the Russian sector. So in the Russian sector, you got to picture this. In the center is Berlin, and in and half of Berlin, is they decide just to put it all together, the western side, the western side. Excuse me. They decide to put it all together, and. So you have Stalin faced with the point, you know, faced with this issue that he has this, but then in the center of it, he has to give up a piece of that to everybody else. So, you know, in a sense, it's like, okay, we divided Germany into four pieces, but how come I have a hole in it? And he's quite angry about this, you know, and, and so he's like, he wants it all for himself. So he decides to do something. He decides to find a way to make all Berlin his Berlin. And what he does is he enacts a blockade. There are three ways into Berlin. Um, you have by rail, by highway, and it's one road in, one rail, and three air corridors, which you can see there in the map. That's how Berlin, that's how you get access to West Berlin, if you're a Westerner. So he decides to seal the road, and he decides to seal the railway. And so the Allies are left with an option, an idea, like, okay, he sealed those off. And why does he steal them off? Because Berlin needs supplies to survive. It's a huge city. It needs food. It needs coal for the winter. It needs all kinds of stuff. And it, you know, it, it, it needs this constant importation of goods. So he feels, Stalin feels, if I shut all this off, starve the people out, freeze them out, the Allies will have to give me Berlin. So he shits those two things. And so the next idea becomes like, what 
can we do? So, you know, they decide, will he shoot down a plane flying through the designated air corridors? And so I feel sorry for the first pilot who had to fly that, but they're like, hey, why don't you fly and go see if you get shot down? So the first pilot takes this route, goes through one of the air corridors, and he's flying, and he sees Russian planes buzzing him, going right close like they're going to attack, but they don't attack. Trying to scare him off, but they never attack. He lands safely in West Berlin. And so now they know he won't shoot down a plane. He doesn't want to start the shooting. So, so every few minutes after that, in order to keep the city fed and warm, Allied planes are landing in the airfield over and over, keeping the supplies open. And here you can see the different you know, airfields in um, Berlin. There you can see um, also you know, how, how the air corridors and um, as one of the video selections I'm giving you, uh, you know, that's also in the other lecture, you can even pause this right now and then go refer to it. There's a video about the candy bomber, which is a really, you know, um, interesting story that goes with the Berlin airlift. It's a very, you know, personal and touching story, but it's another way, in a sense, we're telling Germans like we're going to be friends now. So um, also as part of containment, as part of the Truman Doctrine, NATO is formed, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. What this basically is, is a, is a group of countries that are allied together with us and will stand together in an event of any Soviet attack. And this, you know, in this, and an alliance basically is an attack on one, is an attack on all. So, you know, any threatening gestures the Soviet Union might make in Western Europe in Canada, United States, you know, and, and states in the countries, you know, some just to name a few countries in NATO, you can look at um, Canada, Spain, England, Germany, France, and so forth. Now, um, and this was basically another way of containing communism, but it's also another show of force, you know, another, you know, show of force of the Americans. And then once again, put yourself in the Soviet perspective, you know. Here we are getting all these people together against them. And so it's another, in their eyes, yet another threatening gesture. So the um, Soviet Union decides, you know, we're going to have our own Soviet bloc, our own Warsaw Pact of countries. And it's, it's really, um, I want to say it's kind of sad, but basically their Western bloc, their... Um, you know, uh, Warsaw Pact countries are basically the countries that they've occupied in Eastern Europe. That's all it is. But it's in their way some sort of response to NATO. Now, under the Truman Doctrine, we start to create this huge national security apparatus. You know, uh, one thing we we see the creation of the Air Force. The Air Force, you know, during World War II, you see planes they can fly around, but they're either with the Army Air Corps or the U.S. Marines or Navy. Um, they set up strategic air command, around a clock of surveillance of the skies, you know, Soviet um, airplanes and later Soviet bomber, I mean, um, ICBMs, create the Department of Defense, the Security Council to coordinate, coordinate between the State Department, which does negotiating, and of course, the Defense Department, which kind of backs up negotiations. Also, um, we see the creation of the CIA. The CIA didn't exist in World War II. Um, it, it, it existed, but not in name. You know, we, we had, you know, our, our own, you know, spy organization, the Office of Strategic Services or the OSS, but it becomes formalized after the war in the CIA, who are, you know, used, you know, they, who are used throughout the world to, you know, spy, of course, but to, you know, collect, collect information, to um, help find ways to help overthrow unpopular governments or well, unpopular for us. You see them training people, you see assassinations, you see all kinds of stuff put under the umbrella of the CIA. Also, um, especially after World War II, you know, Israel is, you know, becomes, you know, an, an independent nation. Well, in a sense, um, it, um, the story of Israel is really kind of complicated but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a small piece of it because, you know, later when we're talking about modern America and why, you know, Arabs are after us and so forth. It's our support for Israel. So real quick story as, you know, to give you a little bit of background on the nation of Israel. 
Now, Israel used to be Palestine. Okay? In Palestine, before, let's say, you know, let's, uh, when we're looking at early 1900s before, Palestine was occupied by three groups of people. Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Now, the people that lived in Palestine, and those groups of people I just mentioned, you know, had lived together there since biblical times. Um, they had this, you know, cultural diffusion throughout of them. You didn't see the type of conflict that you see there now. Because these were people who had lived together, you know, for centuries. So, um, you know, why, how did Israel get born and how does this conflict start? Well, sadly, it is the child of Europe. Because, you know, although there's, you know, cultural diffusion, all that going on in Palestine. Um, I remember um, just a quick example. When I took Middle Eastern history, I had to read a diary of a musician that lived in, Pal you know, lived in Palestine. And he described life there as a child. Like it, did, it, it made no difference to them to go to a Jewish friend's house and celebrate, celebrate Passover or Bar Mitzvah, you know, or to go to, a, you know, either his Muslim's friend's house to celebrate Ramadan. And, you know, they came to his house or, you know, celebrate Christmas. Like it was like, you know, just celebrations. They, you know, it was, you know, um, the fact that they had different religions didn't matter as much as, you know, where they lived in their, you know, their general culture. So there wasn't, a, you know, a lot of, you know, um, conflict between the groups. But in Europe, it's a different story. Um, like I, when I talked in World War II, I talked about just how anti-Semitic, you know, you know, which is anti-Jew Europe was. Europe, you know, like I said, you know, there were they were um, segregated. There was only certain kind of occupations they could have, you know, and, and you know, it, Jews have been blamed for everything from the Black Death to all kinds of diseases to the, you know, World War One and so forth. So, you know, hatred for Jews. So the Jews living in Europe become almost like the, you know, what we call the dog. They get kicked around too much. You know, they don't trust nobody. They've been, their whole lives, they just have been mistreated. And this leads to the formation of the group known as Zionists. Zionists were, you know, an, an extreme uh, a party that sought to get, you know, to get out. Not just get out of Europe, excuse me, but to create a homeland where they were safe, where they didn't experience this type of persecution. So, um... Um, they start to form meetings, and incidentally, because they wanted to leave and create their own world, uh, country, um, during World War II, Zionist Jews were the only Jews allowed to have meetings. Hitler allowed it because he thought, you know, they're getting out of here. But anyway, um, so um, at this time, before World War I, um, the Ottoman Empire had fallen on hard times. So they're looking to sell a bunch of land. And, you know, when the, when the Jews are looking for this, and the Zionists are looking for a homeland, they had actually been looking at Argentina, but then the the the, the, the um, it came up that the Ottomans in Palestine, you know, who were in control of Palestine, um, were looking to sell land to get some money into the empire, and so you know Zionists were like, well, that's our homeland. We should start purchasing land. So what they start to do is purchase purchase land and set up settlements. And within these settlements and in this land, what they start to do and what they're still doing today. Is that they start to, you know, they won't hire anybody outside of their own group. Um, they, won't, they won't sell land to anybody but within their own group. Not even other Jews living in Palestine because they see them as too friendly toward others. So when they're pushing these people out, you know, they're just not pushing Muslims and, you know, they're pushing Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And slowly this is how the state of Israel, you know, that's the roots of Israel. The, the country, you know, the country of Israel. Now, all kinds of promises are made during World War I, some to the Israelis, some to the Palestinians, and all, you know, all about trying to get, you know, make the Ottoman Empire fall. And the British are, have been making these these promises back and forth between two groups. And in the end, uh, when the war is over, um, the, um, the Israel, you know, what would become Israel, you know, um, was given some autonomy after the war. Which angered, of course, the Palestinians, and this is where you know some of the fighting starts. After a while, the the, the potato got so hot, the British tossed it to us, and then we, you know we were mandated to oversee Israel, 
and uh, and we saw Israel, Truman saw it, and everyone else has seen it as you know having a foothold in the Middle East, but also because we have a foothold in the Middle East, this will prevent this will help us keep an eye on the Middle East and the spread of communism. Uh, to this day, this is you know very 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 controversial to this you know our, because we end up recognizing the state of Israel. We're the first country to do so, and Israel becomes its nationhood from there. But they've never solidified their borders, which causes conflict when they try to spread their borders, or you know as they perceive borders and the perceived borders of the Palestinians. And this is why we have so much conflict today. Anyway, so. Now, um, the NC, NSC report, basically what it, what it said was, you know, they they took a quick to, you know, study, especially after the atomic bomb, the Russians detonate their own bomb. And they decide, and, and the report um, recommends that we need to build up our military, build more weapons, increase our numbers, and, inc and increase more funding and research into more new weapons and nuclear weapons. And this is, you know, what, in, you know, you know, what, what instills after you know um world war Two. now when we're talking about um containment one of the biggest failures of containment is what happens in china china is um you know it, it, it's been occupied you know for a long time by foreign powers one of the reasons is that china is um isn't when you they've never been really been one united people you have 200 languages being spoke there you have all kinds of different cuisines all kinds of different cultures i mean you look at bruce lee movies even in china they had to be dubbed because he didn't speak the national language so you had a very you know ununited people disunited people so this made it easy for countries to go and take pieces of china whether for trade or to occupy and so um china's always you know um you know, had to deal with these foreigners, but they never really united to defeat them. So, um, and in Japan being no different. Japan invades China during World War II, and we end up with two groups fighting the Japanese, and one's the nationalist led by Chiang Kai-shek. And so, you know, after which we've all, we've maintained what we, you know, the only thing we could hold in China or, you know, China sees as theirs, Taiwan says they're independent. And so we recognize and support Taiwan after this. Now, the first, I guess, hot war of the Cold War would be the Korean War. When we um, look at the Korean War, once again, this is a country that was invaded by Japan, destabilized. When the war's over, you know, in, in Korea, you have two groups of people. You have, and it's kind of funny because in generalities, this is gonna, you're going to hear this again in Vietnam. You have, um, you have the northern part of North Korea, which... You know, um, has communist leniencies, especially because they're bordered with China and they have Chinese support. And you have the southern portion of Korea, which leans more democratic and capitalist and has, of course, has the support of the United States. Now, both sides want to seek reunification. They want to get back together. They want to become one country again because that's what they were before. Um, so after the war, um, um Korea, for the time, in order to keep the peace, you know, is divided the, at the 59th parallel. You know, North Korea, communist, South Korea, Democrat. Both sides, like I said, wanted to reunite. And so um, there was cross-border incursions going both ways, more limited from the south to the north. But um, what you see is China working with North Korea to quickly develop their military, give them huge numbers, gives them tanks, guns you know, um, supplies, anything they need to build up their military. The United States, on the other hand, doesn't really do that for South Korea. You know, they're kind of like, well, you're in our sphere of influence. You know, um, we're nearby in Japan. If you need something, let us know. So uh, once North Korea is armed and ready, they invade South Korea. And so, you know, and you're looking at a couple hundred thousand men invading South Korea. South Korea tops, you know, with, 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 with police 
45,000. And this is a one-sided battle. And if you look at it, it's, it's better if you look at the map as I'm saying this, because it's the best way to explain it, is you'll see um, at the bottom right corner the Pusan perimeter. Um, this That little area there in the corner is basically where the South Korean army is pushed to. Now, when the war starts, when the invasion starts, the United States quickly okay. goes to the United Nations and says, we have to do something. They're destabilizing your Asia and we could have another war. And this is what the United Nations is for. The United Nations agrees that we must get North Korea out of South Korea. So um, they task the United States, which, you know, more than gladly takes up the task to get them out. I um, mean, this is two reasons. One, Truman Doctrine, and two, we have the closest large army we're occupying Japan at the time, and it's under the command of General Douglas MacArthur. So, um, MacArthur sees the situation, as I'm saying, you're looking at this map. Um, incidentally, um, this war is fought, we fight as the UN. We actually don't fight it as the US. Our soldiers wore blue UN patches, but anyway. Um, you look at the map and you see where, you know, that Pusan perimeters where the poor South Korea army is pushed to, you know, surrounded. They're in that little corner, backs the ocean. Now, you can see Japan there. Um, MacArthur, now, you know, forgive my language, MacArthur's an asshole. But he, you know, it, it, you know it has, it has great uh, military tactics. He looks at the situation and realizes, you know, it's going to be stupid of me to land at Pusan and try to fight my way all the way through South Korea. So what he does, what he does, is he lands in Incheon, if you can see it there on the map, which is right on the border of um, North and South Korea. Then from that point, he invades North Korea, which is an easy thing to do because South Korea's, I mean North Korea's army is in South Korea. What does this do? This forces. North Korea to pull it out of South Korea to meet MacArthur as he lays waste to North Korea. You know, this is a you know a very famous military tactic. It was used against Hannibal when Hannibal was laying laying waste to your to Rome. Um, the you know the Romans decide instead because they can't, they can't beat Hannibal they can't beat him they decide to land in Carthage where he's from and invade that again that forces Hannibal to go back home and this is exactly what he does. So, you know, he pulls the, the North Korean army out of South Korea. And he starts marching and marching and marching toward the Yalu River. And the Yalu River is the border between North and Korea and, and China. Truman has been studying reports and he's like, hey, do not go anywhere near the Yalu River nor China. MacArthur ignores this order and starts marching toward the Yalu River. And in his thinking, he's, he tells everyone, don't worry about it. We start a war with China, we drop about 10 atomic bombs, it'll be over with. Don't worry about it. Um, and so as he gets to the Yalu River, he is met with one million Chinese soldiers who storm across the border toward the United States Army and Marine Corps, shoving them all the way back to South Korea. And, you know, and reestablishing the 38th parallel, which becomes a demilitarized zone. Truman is fire. I mean, Truman fires Douglas MacArthur. And sadly, the war ends in an armistice. And, um, which is basically a ceasefire. You know, um, We've, there's no formal treaty. Um, that war could spark at any moment. You know, it didn't really end. You know, we have the border right back where it was. You know, we did, you know, huge losses of lives. When you look at, um, you know, soldiers killed, wounded, and then look at the civilian deaths. 2,700,000. Honestly, this is... Um, one of the things that, um, you know, the, the dictators in North Korea like to show is what we did, the civilian casualties in, during the Korean War, and shows us as the monsters that did this. And one of the many things they used to, and then they talk about how, you know, we never came back and how they won the war, and, you know, see, we're keeping them at bay and so forth.
Now, um, this leaves us in a very tense situation till the 70s between U.S. and China. You know, it's the first in a mini series of wars between, you know, proxy wars. Uh, more money spent in national defense. And you also have, you know, a presidential wartime powers increase, which are increased even more in Vietnam because, you know, acting as a U.N. force, he circumvents Congress in making this war happen. Now let's look at the arms race. Now the arms race is really kind of, it's gotten to the point where I would I'd almost call it kind of like, you know, overblown silly because, you know, basically the arms race is basically, oh, they built 100 missiles, we have to build 200. Oh, they built 200, we have to build 300 and 400 and 500 to the point where we have, hundred, you know, not hundreds, excuse me, you know, tens of thousands of nuclear missiles. The ones we have now, each warhead is about 80 Hiroshima's. All we needed to do is launch eight and the world is over. Period. No matter who shoots him. And, and this concept is known as mutually assured destruction. There are so many missiles out there. No matter where they hit, they'll destroy the world. Um, and so everyone knows who has these missiles that if you just launch one, you might as well just blow your own brains out because you're killing yourself. And this is what's prevented anyone from launching another missile. You know, to this day, the United States is the only one ever to use a nuclear weapon. Now, what is linked to the space race, I mean, to the arms race, is the space race. The, you know, early on in the 40s and the 50s, um, the only way we could actually use nuclear weapons is we had to fly bombers and drop them. And so um, the concept becomes that if I can get a rocket from New York to Moscow, I mean, to the, from here to the moon, we can certainly get one from New York to Moscow. So this like, concept of getting using space as a new place to test out weapons and test out range and new, new sciences, you know, this all be, you know, the, the space race is linked to the arms race. And honestly, for most of the space race, quote unquote, you know, the Russians were winning. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, they launched the first satellite in space. 1957, the launch of Sputnik. Changes the world. Now, nowadays, because of light pollution, you can't really see what's in the sky all that much. But back then, you could literally look up in the sky and see Sputnik flying over. Scared the hell out of the Americans. They didn't know it was in there. Was it a bomb? Poison gas? You know, what are they doing? What is that thing doing? And not only did it scare Americans, it angered them. They were angry at the government. How come the Russians are beating us? How come the Russians have that and we don't have anything? So, 1957, launching a Sputnik launches all kinds of initiatives in the United States. We start to dump millions of dollars into the universities and schools to, you know, um, especially into what we call STEM nowadays. But, you know, to create better thinkers, people who are only going to invent better stuff. You know, and, and, you know um, and part of this is the creation of NASA. And, you know, but also part of this is this fear in the United States about an attack by Russia. Um, we have passage of the National Defense Act, which is, you know, ends up funding, you know, universities, creates NASA and so forth. And, you know, but in the end, you know, Americans are living in anxiety about like nuclear weapons and the menace of the redness, which leads to, you know, the second Red Scare. First one in 1920s, you know, that was linked more to immigration and the Russian Revolution. This one has more to do with um, communism spreading in America as, you know, as part of the Cold War. And so there were fears that were communists everywhere, you know. And so under President Truman, we see the establishment of loyalty boards, which are basically um, um, contracts you had to sign to say that you are a loyal American, and it also gave them the power to investigate you or anyone accused of being a communist or a communist sympathizer. Um, and a lot of times when you're hauled before this and HUAC, which I'll talk about in a second, you know, this is why we, um, we make the connection a lot of times with the Salem Witch Trials and um, the Red Scare of the 50s. In the Salem Witch Trials, the little girls who were accusing these women of witches, of witchcraft, um, would 
introduced to the court what they call spectral evidence. Evidence they could only see. Like they'd be sitting in court going, oh, she's pinching me or she's standing right there, even though no one else could see with the kids. So it was evidence you couldn't refute because, you know, it's the kid, whatever the kids are saying. Well, in this instance, if there were, you know, you're being accused of being a communist, half the time you couldn't see the evidence against you or see the accuser against you, it would be labeled top secret. So it was impossible to fight these things. Now, uh, that is more within the government and within, you know, uh, and the military. So then we have also the establishment of the House for Un-American Activities. And we, you know, we, we call it HUAC. And this is more in, you know, um, more in American life. And uh, one area that they specifically attacked was um, Hollywood. You know, there were a lot of Jews in Hollywood. There were a lot of communists in Hollywood, a lot of communist sympathizers. Hey, that script you wrote about the workers, that sounds like a communist thing. And so you had all these people, you know, calling each other out. You know, at the head of this is the Screen Actors Guild led by, you know, John Wayne and Ronald Reagan, who are accusing all these people and, you know, acting like they're, you know, um, you know good Americans and so forth. And... Um, even though, like, you know, John Wayne didn't even serve in World War II. He's, he, st he stays behind making movies. One of his big targets was a, a writer named Trumbo. And I'll show you little, one of the videos I've linked here is a speech by Trumbo at the end. But, there, you know, there's, there's a film about him as well, and one of the be uh, the, uh, which highlights one of the best interactions between Trumbo and, and John Wayne is when he stands up to, you know, and Trumbo's a small little guy. But, you know, he literally tells John Wayne, he's like, I served in World War II. Where were you? And you call me un-American. You know, in the end, you know, the powers that be, you know, end up kicking a lot of these people out. They end up in prison. They end up getting blacklisted, not being able to um, work in Hollywood again. Although some sneakily do it like Trumbo by using different names, working for B-movies and so forth. But this put a huge scar in America and in Hollywood. Um, one big case that comes out of... Uh, of the, of this time period is the trial of the Rosenbergs. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, first couple, you know, put to death. They were um, accused of treason, selling atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, and they're in, um, eventually executed. And later on, more papers come out that show their true guilt, because there was a little, some questions at the time. Um, just to show you the hatred they had for these people, because they were executed, right? They stole, they stole secrets and gave them to the Russians. Um, years ago, before September 11th, um, we actually were tracking um, the cell phone of the Taliban. Of um, Oh my gosh, I forgot his name. Uh, Osama bin Laden. And the way that Osama bin Laden found out that they were and he destroys his phone is... Someone has gotten this off the FBI. It turns out that there was the assistant director of counterintelligence FBI was a spy selling secrets for money. And he's finally caught. And, you know, they, I think they attribute about 15 deaths of American spies in Russia that were their names are given to them and they were executed. And, you know, you can actually, actually quantify death to this guy. And he only gets life in prison. He doesn't get executed, but these people get executed. This kind of shows you the amount of hatred at the time. You know, and, 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 and profiteering off this fear and hatred is a, at the time, unknown senator named Joseph McCarthy, you know, who makes this huge speech like on my, you know, with a paper in his hand, in my hand, I have the name of 50 card carrying communists you know, working in the federal government. The next time it's 70, and then it's 20 and 50. The Duke can keep the numbers right. You know, anyone who challenged him about it, it would be labeled a communist. And this guy ruined many repu people's reputations, sent a lot of people to jail. Um, he's finally challenged by uh, uh, one of the most famous um, newspaper men, of the time, not newspaper men, reporter of the time, Edward R. Murrow. And um, he challenges him on his program. He was the most respected guy at the time. So having him challenge him was a big thing. And he spends an hour like tearing apart his lies and stuff. Then Murrow even gives him the next hour to refute it. He doesn't do a very good job and he's eventually censured in Congress. And he was doing this, feeding off this fear because he was hoping for a presidential run.
kind of like, you know, uh, Mussolini and Hitler fed off fear to gain power. Now, following Truman is President Eisenhower. President Eisenhower, former Supreme Allied Commander at D-Day, um, he, um, you know, actually, he's a staunch anti-communist, but he also hates war. And um, he always is, you know, he warns America later about the industrial military industrial complex. Um, he also looks to, you know, his foreign policy is in the Middle East, what's called the Eisenhower Doctrine, promoting and stopping the spread of communism in the Middle East. Now, um, Eisenhower presides over a great economy during the 50s. I mean, all kinds of prosperity. Before, you had ration books. That's all you could use to go to the store. Now, all that cash you have pent up, you can go buy. Buy, buy, buy. And then, of course, like, you know, all the jobs open up. You know, right now, everything's made in China or India. Back then, everything made in the United States. And then, of course, you have the main big impact of the GI Bill. The GI Bill did so much for America. Um, the GI Bill allowed for three things. You can use it to go to college. You can use it to buy a home. You can use it to start a business. So all this puts money into the economy. So you have that for going for you as well. When I said the GI Bill had a huge impact, um, what we'll, you'll see people, especially in poverty, poor people, and you know, in the, you know, minorities and whites who go to college for the first time ever because of the GI Bill. And especially in minorities, you'll look at these guys will be lawyers and stuff during the civil rights era and so forth. Also, to put people to work, but also um, as copying kind of the Autobahn in Germany, um, the Interstate Highway Act of 56 creates this huge highway system across America. You know, of course, we use it today for leisure and travel and commerce. But at the time, the idea was we we're in the middle of the Cold War. We might get invaded and we need to be able to move our troops anywhere possible, kind of like Hitler's Autobahn. 1950s saw a huge boom in the population, what we call the baby boom. Um, you know, and there's different reasons for that. Of course, you know, soldiers come home and nine months later, but you also have people that can afford to have more kids and so forth. And people have, can afford different foods and stuff and live longer in our population booms. People now have money to move out of the cities and you see the growth of suburbs, especially like I said, GI, uh, GIs could purchase homes with the GI Bill. And so, you know, construction, housing, money flowing. You know, and then women, of course, get relegated, sadly, back to housework and the role of the good women in 1950s society. And so um, we see women, you know, who are working, of course, in the factories and stuff, relegated back to the traditional roles as being mothers and, you know, um, wives and staying home and so forth. So in the 1950s also, we have this um, age of conformity, which is really funny to me and ironic because we're very anti-communist, but we almost become communist in the sense that we all start dressing the same, looking the same, buying the same things, you know, having the same hairstyles, um, listening to the same stuff. You know, in a sense, it's like almost communism. And, of course, you have this mass consumerism, keeping up with the Joneses. They bought a new car. We got to buy a new car. Um, and, you know, like, and we, let's, let's look at housing real quick. And I mean, we kind of see this today in different, you know, suburbs and stuff, you know, communities. You know, houses, prefab houses. You have houses that all look the same. Neighborhoods are arranged the same. And then what you also have in, in the 50s is the introduction of the television. Television has a huge impact on, on America, kind of like the Internet will later on. In 1950, you see 3.9% of people owning TVs. By 1960, 86.7% own TVs. And what does TVs do for you? It tells you what America looks like, what you should look like, what you should purchase. You know, what it is to be American. And you know, consumerism, the new refrigerator, the new, you know, iron, the new blender, toaster, whatever. Uh, you know, people are putting, you know, seeing what they should be buying and you know going out and buying it like today with commercials and stuff then you also see like the first one that's targeted at kids which is the mickey mouse club you know you had this show on tv and you know you know marketing basically for disneyland and you know disney and toys and stuff that have to do with you know mickey mouse and so forth and this first targeted toward kids um now when you have all this 
you also have like um people that go against this sort of thing people that you know um aren't happy to be wearing the same clothes and listen to the same music as their parents you know they're not happy with any of this stuff they want change they, they feel stifled they feel trapped so you know you have a counterculture movement and the birth of rock and roll coming out of the 50s more youth-centered music and i'll get into a little bit more about that in a second now, um, I already spoke about, about the Highway Act. Let's go ahead and skip past that. Now, another thing in the 1950s people were living with was fear. fear. Constant fear of a nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. And this pure fear pervaded everything. And so you had people, kind of like we see doomsday preppers today, building fallout shelters in their backyards. They're, you know, they're being sold. You know, they're being... You know, um, stockaded, stocked up with food and supplies, as you see in that picture there. Um, and so you have this culture where, you know, they're constantly in fear, you know, so scared that they build these things. At school, they would have duck and cover drills, which were basically, you know, uh, they would have kind of like, and it's really sad, you know, today we have, you know, code blacks or whatever, you know, to hide from shooters and so forth. Back then, you know, oh, nuclear blast coming, get under your desk, duck and cover. You know, and like the desk could do, do, do anything, you know. Or they would even teach you if you're outside to curl up in a ball and, and, and throw your sweater over your head or something like that's going to protect you. All these things were, were designed to, you know, try to lessen some of the anxiety. Um, because in reality, there's nothing you could do. I mean, we, we have those huge bunkers and stuff like, you know. And, 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 you know, you see the movies, they haul the president into the bunkers, they seal it up and stuff like that. The truth is the president would never make it there. He'd have to be there. It's only a few minutes. But it makes people feel better. It, it helps alleviate some anxiety, so it exists. So, you know, pervading through 50s all the way to the 80s is this fear of nuclear war, always hovering over their heads. Now, um, one influential person to emerge as far as society and culture was a man named Dr. Benjamin Spock, who wrote this book about baby and child care, who basically advocated for the fact that, um, you, know, we, you know, the best role of women is to be at home raising babies. You know, women who tried to want more than that, you know, their husbands were like, see, scientific proof. You need to stay home and take care of the family. That's it. That's your role. That's the best thing for society. And this put lots of pressure on women, you know, to, you know, fill these roles, to be a good woman, to be a good American and so forth. So, like I mentioned earlier, you have this sense of alienation growing. People that didn't want to fit into that same square peg. People that didn't want to wear their, you know, suit and tie all the time. They didn't want to have their hair cut a certain way all the time. Women who wanted to do more than just sit at home and make babies and so forth. And, you know, and then, of course, just plain youth rebellion. And you see this in the 1950s play itself out in films, music, literature, poems. And one of the more, more important um, books to be published in the 50s is The Fem uh, Femin Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedman, which kind of opens like this. And she's basically saying, you know, um, you know, women, you know, is this your life? You get up, you know, make breakfast, get the kids up, you know. We get their lunches ready, get your husband's lunch ready, you know, um, get them all, you know, fed, get, you know, on the bus or, you know, get the husband's lunch and he takes off. Then you start the laundry, you start cleaning the house. Um, and, you know, then you have to start dinner and then, you know, everyone comes home, you feed them, wash dishes, you know, maybe finish the laundry, go to bed, then do it again the next day and the next day. For the rest of your life do you feel like there's like a hole in you do you feel like there's something missing do you feel unfulfilled do you feel like you know you know is this all there is to life and in truth lots of women back then felt this in fact a lot of them were antidepressants they're referred to as mother's little helper well here comes betty friedman saying it doesn't have to be that way you know, you, you have the right. You've got the right to vote in 1919. You can go to school. You can have something else. You don't just have to be a mother. Or you don't just have to be a wife. 
Now, a lot, of, you know, what we see here is the beginnings of the women's you know, movement, the feminist movement. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, misunderstand the, you know, the feminist movement, and they're like, "Oh, it's anti-mother, it's anti-man." No, it's basically saying nothing wrong with staying home and having kids if that's what you want, but that doesn't have to be your only choice. And so, you know, there were some of the lower middle class. Oh, well, mind you, um, everything I'm talking about pretty much applies to white people. Uh, minorities did not experience this like this in this kind of numbers. But anyway, going back to it, um, we, there were some women who did work, but it was usually in, you know, women's roles as, for, you know, teachers, secretaries, nurses, so forth. Um, because, the, you know, they were trying to keep up with the Joneses and they needed that extra income. Now, youth culture. You know, and here you see a picture from a famous show, Happy Days, about the 1950s. And, you know, this is like, you know, uh, more mainstream, what you, you know, clean cut and so forth. Um, but um, but on the other side were, were youths that didn't want that. They wanted to rebel. They wanted to wear their hair different. They wanted to wear something different. They wanted to look like this. You know, greasers. They wanted, you know, they were referred to as juvenile delinquents. Just wearing a leather jacket made you a hoodlum. Um, you know, they didn't want to listen to their parents' music. They wanted to, you know, not just to act out, but to be more free, break out of this conformity of society. Then you see the challenges to the roles of women and how they're portrayed, especially in film. There at the bottom, you see Doris Day, typical 50s housewife. There on top, of course, you see Marilyn Monroe exuding sexuality, the exact opposite of Doris Day. You know, exuding the freedom of herself to express herself in any way she wants to. Now, finally, there's music. Um, it begins as what they would, you know, depending on where you lived, um, it would be called race music, which is blues, you know, African-American music. But, you know, slowly, um, more and more people had access to it, um, depending on where you lived. But, you know, sadly, like almost everything else, it takes, you know, a white person to do something with it to open it up. And that was Elvis Presley. You know, mixing an amalgamation of blues and country, you get rock and roll. There were people before him, but he's the one that becomes a star with it. And him playing that kind of music made it okay to listen to that kind of music, made it okay for radio to play that kind of music. It was still controversial, even when he did it, but not as controversial as a single black man up there doing it. So he opens a door to minorities to be able to put their place in rock and roll. And here you see, you know, Chuck Berry, Elvis, and of course, uh, and on the bottom corner, Richie Valens, first Mets and American rock and roll star, has the first hit all in Spanish, La Bamba. And so, you know, um, he opened, you know, even though, you know, he's, he really just took it and went with it, you know, but he opens the door for others. One last major thing to talk about that comes out of the 50s is Jonas Salk invents the vaccine for polio and polio um, is a disease that you know crippled FDR and um, and it, it, it's a disease of the muscles and so that um, it, it eventually can make its way to your chest where you stop breathing so you have to be in an iron lung this machine that breathes for you and this thing basically this vaccine eradicated this horrible disease well, that's it for today. Um, the next lecture I'll give you is the Cold War in the 1960s. Um, uh, once again, if you don't see my message on Blackboard and so forth, but you know, if you need any help or any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.